Well, hi everybody, uh, good evening and welcome to this virtual West Cork Literary Festival event. My name is Emer Hurley and I'm the Festival Director of West Cork Literary Festival. Um, normally we'd be doing this event in, in Bantry in the summer. Um, that wasn't unfortunately possible last summer, um, but we are still holding out hope that we'll all be in Bantry this year from the 9th to the 16th of July. Um, in the meantime, we're doing a number of online events um, throughout the season, um, just I suppose to keep in touch with our audiences and our writers and to keep ourselves entertained and occupied as well. Um, so we're really delighted to be here today with Danielle McLaughlin to celebrate the publication date of her novel, The Art of Falling, which is published today um, for John Murray. And shortly, Danielle is going to be in conversation with Sue Leonard. Um, so I'd like to welcome both Sue and Danielle, but also to welcome you guys, the audience. There are, I think, 67 um, people here with us tonight. Um, so thank you to, and welcome to all of you. And I'd just like to give a thank you as well to our funders, the Arts Council of Ireland, um, Cork City Council, Vulture Ireland, and the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union, um, as all of those funders have enabled us to continue bringing these events to you this year. And also just to give a shout out to Bantry Bookshop, our local bookshop, um, they will have signed copies of Danielle's novel, um, should anybody like to order directly from Bantry Bookshop. Other than that, we would strongly encourage you to support your own local bookshop, um, as they're all working away behind the scenes, you know, through websites, um, they're all at the end of a telephone, so certainly encourage you to, to shop locally. Um, just a couple of little housekeeping things. There's a chat button at the bottom, as many of you have seen, if you want to chat to each other. If you do have any questions for Danielle, you'll see a Q&A button, um, a little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you could put your questions in there and towards the end of the event, um, Sue will be taking a few questions from the audience. So she'll take questions from there and we'll put some of them to Danielle. So I'm now going to hand you over to Sue. Sue will be introducing you to Danielle. So I just want to say a few words of introduction to Sue. Um, Sue Leonard is a journalist and ghostwriter. She also reviews books for the Irish Examiner and has a weekly column, Beginner's Pluck, in the Irish Examiner every Saturday, where she features a debut writer each week. She is currently working with actor and theatre producer Ronan Smith on his memoir, If Memory Serves Me Wrong, which will be published by New Island Books in May of this year. Um, so. I'd like to raise, well, I'm going to raise a cup of coffee, I'm afraid, um, to Danielle, and I'm going to hand you over now to Sue and Danielle, and I wish, uh, wish you all a wonderful launch event, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's event, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Ema. I rather wish I was with you in, I rather, can, can you see me? I'm not quite sure if I'm on the screen or not. Um, Thank you very much to Ema for that lovely introduction. I'm very jealous of her being in Paros while I'm sitting in County Wicklow. Um, I don't think Danielle needs very much introduction, really. Um, Anne Enright, reviewing Dinosaurs and Other Planets, said, this is not a debut in the usual sense, a promise of greater things to come. This book has arrived. At that stage, Diane, Danielle had al already won prizes for her short stories. Stinging Fly published that um, debut and they, um, she was published, I think New York Times, perhaps even before the, that came out. There have been so many prizes since then. I think I'd be here all night if I, if I listed them all, but the notable ones were the Wyndham Campbell Prize and the Sunday Times Audible Short Story Award, which actually contained big money, which must be quite wonderful for her, not just a statuette or something. Um, it's naturally increased expectation for the debut novel. Um, the Art of Falling, and would it live up to its promise? I think perhaps there was a bit of nervousness amongst her fans um, wondering this. Um, when my copy arrived, I was actually busy reading other books to deadline, but I picked it up very idly and read the first page and I literally could not put it down again. Um, as a reviewer, I'm always looking for the writer's tricks to try and work out how they've, just how they have done it, how they put it together. Um, and this, there are so many elements in this book. There's betrayal and feminism, there's art and the way we talk about it, to how the past catches up with us. And there's a mystery element to it as well, but it is absolutely seamless. I couldn't see the writer behind the scenes, how she was working at all. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. And it's also a quite beautiful book. So Danielle, I'm, I'm just in awe of you. Um, so Danielle is now going to give a reading 
And after that, I will be putting questions to her. And then Azima said, we will be taking your questions from the Q&A bit. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this evening. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you very much, Sue, um, for all those lovely words. I'm so happy that I have this opportunity this evening to celebrate the launch of The Art of Falling. So my thanks to Emer and to West Cork Literary Festival for that. Before I do a short reading, I also want to say thanks to my editors and publishers for getting The Art of Falling out into the world, um, especially to Becky Walsh of John Murray and to Elaine Egan of Hachette Ireland. And um, my thanks as always to my brilliant agent, Lucy Luck, and to all my writer friends with a special shout out to my, my writers group. Um, so thanks everyone. I'm going to read just a couple of pages. Um, it's a section where Nessa, my main character, is um, she goes out for a walk with her husband, Philip, because this is something that the marriage counsellor has suggested that they do. Um, her marriage is coming back together in the aftermath of her husband's affair. And the affair was a very messy one because um, the person he had the affair with was another local mother, a woman called Cora Wilson, who is the mother of um, Nessa's daughter's best friend. So I'm going to read a little bit where they're going for a walk in Cork. And I've just remembered I need to put my glasses on for this bit. Okay. The counsellor had suggested that they take walks, not separately, but together. And that evening, they put Bailey on his lead and headed down Sunday's Well Road. They paused on the pedestrian bridge on North Mall where evening was settling on the water, bobbing ducks, dipping and splashing. Bailey squatted to relieve himself beside the rusty railings, and she plucked a bag from the bone-shaped dispenser attached to his lead. Allow me, Philip said, taking the bag from her. Who says romance is dead, she said, as he stooped to clean up after the dog. He laughed, and they crossed the bridge, walked up river to the Lee Maltings. Bailey, as he always liked to do, snuffled at the key walls and its flowers blooming in their crevices. They looped down Liberty Street and onto Patrick Street. Philip stopped outside the modern clothing store. Didn't you have a yellow jumper like that, he said, pointing to the mannequin in the window. Nessa looked. The jumper wasn't remotely like the one she used to own, apart from the fact that it had sleeves and a hole for the head and was yellow. She felt the familiar dread rising all the same. I always liked that jumper on you, he said. How come you never wear it anymore? Nessa tugged at Bailey's lead. Come along, Bailey, she said. The day she'd found out about Cora Wilson and Philip, she was wearing a yellow Ted Baker jumper with pink trim at the cuffs and a pair of black trousers. She'd bundled the jumper in a ball the next day and put it in the bin. She'd known she'd never wear it again, although in fact she missed that jumper. The black trousers went in the bin too, but at least they'd been from pennies. She'd never replaced the jumper, not even with a cheaper model. But after she threw it out, every time she opened the wardrobe door and saw the empty hanger, she was reminded of Cora Wilson. She threw the hanger in the bin too. But then the empty space reminded her of Cora. And when she pushed other things along the rail to fill it, every item that swung into that space seemed to take up a chant, Cora, 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 until she knew she had to move them back to where they'd come from, or they would all be tainted by Cora Wilson and she'd have nothing left. One evening, 
She'd pulled the door off that wardrobe, wrenched it off with the pliers in such a way that the body of the wardrobe cracked and there was nothing for it but to throw the whole thing out. Philip carried it outside and chopped it up and put it in the bin. Now, as she walked ahead of him down Patrick Street, Bailey straining at the leash, registering her need to be away, she thought that she couldn't recall Philip remarking on the wardrobe. But then a lot of things got broken around that time. For a while, she'd resisted getting a new wardrobe because the only space for it was in the space vacated by the old one. Even now, she used the new one sparingly and without lingering, pulling a shirt quickly off the rail and shutting the door again. She felt despair settle on her. Every place and everything was steeped in reminders. How could a counsellor fix that? How could she ever move on? Steady on. Philip had caught up with him. I didn't know it was race. It's Bailey, Nessa said. I think he's had enough. So I'm just going to leave Nessa and Philip and Bailey there. Thank you for listening. It was absolutely lovely. The opening of this book is just so brilliant. As a mother of four kids, you know, being summoned into school has to be the worst thing that can happen to you. And I suppose your worst fear is probably that your child is being bullied. But to be called in, to be told that your child is actually bullying somebody else, I, I can't imagine. But then this sickener punch thing, are oh, the problems at home. And of course, you think that's just a passing comment, but very quickly you realize that the, the teacher clearly knows, because everybody knows, that her husband is having an affair with this, this the, the former best friend's mother. I mean, it, it just punches you in the chest. But what really interested me is that it, it's well documented that when you started off this with, as a short story, it was about the chalk sculptor, which of course is a huge element of the book. So what I was wondering was how in the system of writing this book, I know it's been quite a long process, how did you get from the chalk sculptor to messy marriages? Okay. Well, the chalk sculpture started out back in 2012. So that was at a writing workshop at Watford Writers Weekend. And I did a workshop with fantastic Nuala O'Connor. Oh, she's great. And yeah, yeah, it was a brilliant workshop. And as part of it, she gave us writing prompts. And for my prompt, I got this piece of broken pottery and I held it in my hand and was very chalky. And I was just holding it and thinking about what might come to me. And it did send very, um, very vivid images into my head. And there was a sense of conflict and, and struggle there. So the chalk sculpture, which in the novel is best known piece of sculpture made by the deceased artist, Robert Locke, um, that started out in 2012 in that workshop. And for a couple of years, I tried to write it as a short story, but it, there was always something missing from the short story. The chalk sculpture was always there, but it was never enough. There was always something missing. And I was in Kilreely Writers Retreat ah. in 2014, yeah. which is a fabulous place. I've been there, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. It's so remote and it's so isolated and you go into your own little restored famine cottage and it's just you writing away in this cottage right by the edge of the cliffs. And so I was working um, at Kilreely on, and I, I, I said characters really that I was intending to write a novel about, and there was something missing from them, from them as well. And it was while I was at Kilreely that I realised that the characters and this statue of the chalk sculpture actually belonged all together. You know, to put them together, they made a whole thing when I put them together. Mm -hmm. And then there were lots of other things after that that you know over time sort of gathered on to those two things then like you know like moss growing on something they just grew around it. Mm. So do you have any background in art? Um, I don't know. Um, 
I did art for my leaving cert and I really, really enjoyed doing it, but I had no talent. Um, but I loved writing about it. So I could write about art and get through the leaving cert exams, but I had no talent. Um, so in a way for me, um, the art of falling has sort of allowed me to, to, um, to get involved in making sculpture without, without making sculpture because yeah. I had to invent um, a catalogue of work and think about what the sculpture in the novel would have made and what those pieces might have looked like and what might have influenced him at different stages of his career. So yes, that I enjoyed that. It was, it was good um, to be able to make these pieces in my head and put them on the page, even though I, you know, I would have zero talent to make them in real life. Every, everything about your writing screams born writer. It's just, you're made for it. Yet, you're a lawyer. And it was only illness that stopped you doing law. And you happened upon writing? Or were you actually a child who was scribbling away short stories and wanting to be right? How did, how was it? How was that arc of becoming a writer? Well, I was, uh, I was a child who's always reading books. Yep. So I was always reading um, from when I was very young. Um, I, around about 16 or 17, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer and I, I really, really did want to be a lawyer. Like it wasn't, there are no lawyers in my family and okay. it wasn't anything that anyone was pushing me to do or anything like that. I just decided I really wanted to be a lawyer. I, I loved the, the idea of working with words and working with words in a way that impacted so closely on people's lives and, and all the stories that that were behind the law cases, I suppose. So it was very that's much- so, Sorry, so that, that's so interesting though, because you think of law as being a very dry profession. Mm. So you actually were attracted by the creativity of it. Yes, yeah. And I think, you know, there's so many stereotypes out there about mm. law. I think I have, well, I can only speak for myself that I found it very creative and um, really interesting in terms of language. Um, mm. It's also a very, very, tough and very pressured um, environment to work in. Yeah. You know? um, it's, I have to say that it's much easier to be able to get up in the morning and you know, sit down with my notebook and scribble away at, at my own pace. But um, I, I really did like the work involved. Mm. You know? Yeah. So maybe if I hadn't got sick that time, maybe I'd still be practicing law and maybe I wouldn't have well, I hate to say I hate to say to anybody I, I'm I, I'm glad you were ill, but it certainly did the world a service. <laughs> well, I like the way it has worked out as well. Um, I was wondering, uh, you you were published by the Stinging Fly originally, yeah. and the short stories, and they published your short stories. Um, how important do you think these small publishers are in Ireland? Oh. Absolutely, absolutely crucial for the development of writers because having um, publishers like The Stinging Fly, it, it just brings a reality to the possibility of actually getting published and knowing that someday someone will read this thing that you're, that you're working on. So um, if we didn't have those publishers, there wouldn't be anyone um, to send our, our stories out to as, as emerging writers. And there wouldn't be anyone there to help us along in those early stages of developing as a writer when we need a lot of support and guidance and we need the time to, to get things right. Because mm -hmm. I think with everything, like every other profession, um, there's all an awful lot of learning that has to happen, mm -hmm. especially in the early years. And there's an awful lot of craft to be learned. Um, so, you know, I know with the Stinging Fly Press that I was very grateful that I was allowed as much time as I wanted to, to write my first collection. And I did, it took me quite a while, but um, I think it's, it's just a crucial support for emerging writers to have the Stinging, Fly, the Stinging Fly Press and other independent publishers and the literary journals. I think it's so good that we have such a strong literary journal scene in Ireland, so many places to send our work to. And that means there's 
No, there, there's a sense of possibility. There is a sense that if I keep going with this, there is a place that I can actually send the finished story to, rather than thinking, oh, you know, when you get stuck or when you're having a down writing day, um, thinking, well, what's the point in finishing it? Sure, who is ever going to want to read it? I think we have such a vibrant um, journal scene in Ireland that, you know, writers know that there are loads of places that are willing to read it. Now, the novel has taken a long time as well. Um, I mean, my goodness, I can see why now. <laughs> Uh, I mean, like Anne Enright is not, a, is, this isn't a debut. This is this is a novel written by somebody who's been writing all their life, as far as I'm concerned. It's just extraordinary. Um, but in those years when your readership were waiting rather anxiously for the novel, was the pressure? Did you feel any pressure? Um, I can't say that I felt any pressure while I was writing it. I think Maybe because, you know, as you say, maybe it has to do with the fact that I was writing it over such a long time anyway. Um, so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel any pressure as such. I think maybe also I was struggling so much with the novel. Um, you know, I had so many th times I had to go back and unpick things and I won't say start again, but I had to do an awful lot of big serious work rewrites. So there was very much that pressure going on internally to get the story out onto the page. Um, so in a way I was maybe less conscious then of, of outside, outside pressures. And you know, it was absolutely wonderful to win um, those prizes I got. And I, it must have been. 19, it was absolutely fantastic. And yeah. was a lovely affirmation, but, um, they didn't come with any sense of, of pressure. And I think I had started the book a long time before those prizes happened anyway. So and they, so big, big, big money. I mean, that must have helped too. The, yes. Given you, given you time. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, such a practical mm. support um, yeah. for writers to get money. Um, it was fantastic, yeah. Mm. Well, characters, I wouldn't say they're unlikable, but they are so human and so real and we see their flaws and they get to understand their flaws and there's quite a lot of self-dislike I feel with them. Uh, you, I put on a, um, you and Donald Ryan I think are the two writers who everybody loves, who nobody, I haven't heard anybody say a bad word about Donal and I have never heard anyone say a bad word about you there's never seems to be any jealousy it's always wow they're so talented and I admire them and isn't it fantastic um you're very light and I just wondered in your head do you see that well or is there a bit of Nessa in you um they're, okay, so I have to be careful about saying um, that Nessa is in me because she does some stuff that I would <laughs> like to be associated with. Sure. Um, there, I think there are probably bits of her in me. I do know, um, I think it's interesting you say that there was kind of self, self-hatred going, going on in place of the characters maybe um, don't like themselves or hate themselves because when I wrote the novel in first person, which I had tried um, in some of the earlier drafts, there was a lot of, I think maybe self-hatred channeling through that I voice onto Nessa. So I became mm. a bit kinder to Nessa, I think, when I, when I pulled back a little bit from what was perhaps self-hatred, um, me projecting um, bits of self-hatred onto Nessa and moving it to third person, I think did, did help with that. Um, it is an extraordinary journey that we take without take, giving any spoilers, but you, you start off, she is the victim very much. And then of course the work doesn't go, which we can come on to the chalk sculpture, but, but work isn't great either. And gradually as we learn more about her, we have less sympathy, should we say. The way that you structure that, and I've already said, I can't, I can't see how it was structured at all. It's, it's, it's so seamless. But the way that you drop that in gradually and we gradually learn things, uh, is that, is, is, that must be difficult to do. Well, I think there were a number of 
things that helped with that that layering or that weave of the different parts of it and one of them was um just the time i think that i was involved in writing it because time helped i was with the characters so long so i'd spent so much time with them over the years that time in itself helped with that kind of weave and things things coming together but also input from other people so um my agent lucy luck read this book so many times and gave me great feedback on it my editors read the book so um i got a lot of input from other people as well and um that helped with every rewrite and there were there were quite a lot of rewrites yeah the timing is wonderful and you even have a sort of thriller element at the end oh I, i'm i'm glad you think so i'm glad you think so yeah. So now, now let's get to the to the whole artist thing and and the the you know that Nessa when this woman appears at her at her talk she's given and says but hang on I own that thing I should be you should know who I am I'm really important in this artist's life and she absolutely dismisses her doesn't she mm -hmm. because we all believe she'd read all the papers she she knew all about this artist she'd been studying him for ages and there's absolute disbelief. And this whole thing that we do believe what we read, we don't we we don't open ourselves to possibility that someone's lying, generally. Um, yeah, but I think you've frozen on me. Um, I think mm. sometimes it can be easier to go along with the accepted story rather than have some awkward other versions um, coming in, and. I think with Nessa, she likes things to um, she likes things to to go along nice and easily with as little disruption as possible. So um, if that means perhaps keeping to a certain version of the story, um, and if she can get away with that, then she's happy to do so. Um, but one of the things I think in the novel is that Nessa finds that she um, she can't turn her back on certain elements of her past and she can't just go along with the version of the story that she would like to believe and so we have we have changes in the narrative and I was interested in having that idea of a changing narrative playing out in Nessa's professional life um, oh, there you are did, 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 did I did you freeze or was that me? Um, I'm not sure. I kept talking. Um, I don't know whether people can could hear me or not. Maybe the audience. How do I hang on view? I'm just going to speak you for one mute. second. Uh, every, uh, it was just you, Sue. Danielle was absolutely fine. We could all still hear her. Oh, gosh, I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, cool. um, I'm going away. This big. There. OK. So, so, so I, what, what have I missed? Had you, you'd answered the question. Well, I, I did, well, I hope I did. I was, I was saying how I think Nessa is someone where it suits her to stick to a particular version of a story if she can get away with it. Okay. And she doesn't like the story being changed if it's going to make her life awkward. But one of the things in the novel is that actually she has to face things and things do get awkward yeah. and she doesn't get away with maybe accepting the easiest version of things yeah. and there is you know it always interests me why do we believe some people and not others and um i remember when i was like maybe in my late teens reading white sargasso sea by jean reese and that book had such an effect on me because of the way it was the first book that really brought home to me um how you know nar existing narratives can be challenged and the idea that it was the narrative of this like famous book that um, was being challenged by White Sargasso Sea. I thought that was amazing. So yeah, I think the idea of maybe challenging narratives is something that crops up in the novel and it's there in Nessa's personal life as well as in the work she's doing in her professional life. Yeah, there's a lovely comment um, when Amy was at a lecture that, that he was giving, 107. You remember this comment and she makes a comment um here we are 
it's not the use I make of it. It's the use it makes of me talking about art. And later in life, Nessa hears him using that very sentence that Amy, the student, said to him in a lecture 20 years before. Um, this thing of stealing somebody's words, and it, uh, that's, that, that's a bit of an issue in this book as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is, I think. Um, and I suppose I was interested in the idea of, of questioning and in um, ownership of stories and art and the stories that come to attach to pieces of art, um, because there's a piece of art and then there's all the stories and the meanings that grow up around the interpretation of that piece and about the history of that piece. So um, I suppose I'm just interested in the way that um, we can sometimes challenge those stories or sometimes just accept them without challenge as being the official version. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, maybe it's important to remember that nothing is beyond challenge and that maybe it's danger to, dangerous to, to stop questioning. Yeah. The atmosphere in that house um, with Loretta and um, what are they called? What are the names? You know, the mother and daughter, El Eleanor, Eleanor and Loretta. It's you. You just sense it. You, every time I, I, I get, I, I got a bit sort of. I felt a bit low every time I got walked into that house. I was wondering what she was going to be confronted with next. There was somehow this incredible. You devote this amazing atmosphere of. I don't know what it was quite. Uh, old worldliness, sort of. Um, yeah. Did, did did you do you see these places as you write them? Did you see that house? Yeah, I would have quite a clear picture of it in my head as I wrote. So I would see the layout of it in my head as I wrote, and I would see where they had their cupboards and where they had their tables and chairs and things like that. Um, of course, uh, the other thing is, is um, as they, the, there are three marriages really in this, aren't there? You're, you're having quite a quite a, an intrinsic look at marriage and about why people stay and why they don't and why do you hang around in a, in a has possibly not very good marriage. Do you think there's anything to do with this fact? I think I read a statistic once that if your parents were divorced, you were, I can't remember what the statistic was, but the likelihood of you getting a divorce was much higher. Okay. Because presumably you'd seen your parents divorcing and they were okay. So you know, and the reverse, I think, is perhaps true, that you've come from a stable family um, where the parents stay together and therefore that is your norm and therefore that is what you assume your marriage will be. Do you think this, when you're examining it, how do, how do you see that? Yeah, so, when, so in the novel, I think there, even though we only have a very small glimpse into the marriage of Nessa's own parents, I think we can see that it wasn't a happy marriage, but it was a marriage that continued. And it was only after I finished writing the novel um, that I started wondering, is this maybe part of the reason why Nessa stays in her own marriage, that this is something she has learned. This is her experience of marriage, that people stay together even if um, maybe they're not suited together or they're not getting on. But um, I wasn't conscious of that connection while I was writing. I just knew that this was what Nessa's life had been in the past, and this was what she was doing now. Um, so it was kind of after that I was doing a bit of um, I suppose psychoanalysis myself of Nessa of figuring out what might have um, what might have influenced the, the decisions mm -hmm. that she makes. She's also um, she's also a survivor, I think, in that yep. um, you know she'll she'll do what she'll do what it takes for her to survive and get through a situation and keep going. Um, so sometimes I think she's quite a pragmatic approach as well to, to problem solving. You're quite strong as well on, on the feminism and, and how 
in marriage, I mean, it's, it's, it's very subtly said, really, but she's the one who seems to be doing most of the donkey work. Um, he's the one who, when he says, I have a job here, jump. She has to jump. Uh, even now, when we've come on so far in Ireland, I think, do you think that is still the truth? That is still the way it works? Hmm. I think, um, so I'm thinking about it now as someone who's now in my 50s and I kind of wrote that book through my 40s. So the Ireland that I had in my head that was the Ireland that I had come up through. So that was very definitely part of the picture, I think, in the Ireland of, say, the late 20th century. Is it still the way now? Um, I don't know. I would, I would hope that it isn't to the same extent, but it is still for some people. And there is definitely um, still lots of work to be done, you know, um, in feminism. So it's not like everything, everything is fixed. I think that's it was the way in in Nessa's marriage, and there is the whole question of um, why why does she put up with with certain things, and that's that you know universal and eternal question: Why do people sometimes people who are intelligent, strong people, why do they put up with certain things in relationships? What what leads them? to make those choices and decisions. Of course, another element is the mother-daughter relationship, which is going through that slightly tense phase where this delightful 15-year-old is now being a little bit problematic and will she settle down or will she go a little bit wilder? Do you have teenagers? Um, I have three teenagers. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I eavesdrop on their conversations, but um, they're not the teenagers in this book. Um, I, I feel sorry for Jennifer and Nessa's daughter in this book because I think um, she's in the position of, you know, suffering from the poor choices made by her parents. Absolutely, parent. absolutely. And she has a lot of things now that are impacting on her day-to-day -day life. She has a lot of things to sort out. Her life has been made a lot harder. And none of it was her fault. It, it wasn't her doing. Mm. And of course, there is a slightly complex aspect to that um, mother-daughter relationship that Jennifer tends seems to blame her mother for yep. what her father had. And of course, the past impinging in the form of Luke, who was yes. the best friend's son. And he, he comes into the story and has a good stir as well. <laughs> Um, you're in a writer's group. Is that important to you? Oh, yeah, um, massively. So we've been writing together now since 2011. Yep. Um, we met at writing workshops at the Munster Literature Centre and we formed our own writing group afterwards. And we, um, we aim to share work twice a month. Right. And actually, we had we had a meeting just the other night over Zoom. So, um, hello, guys! If any of you are out there in the audience, I think I think you might be. Um, thanks for all the, the writing help over the years. But yeah, there, like I would say to anyone, um, like it's one of my like chief writing tips as well as read, read, read okay. would be to, to join a writing group because the benefit of having people to share work with and get honest feedback and the support of, of the group as well. Yeah. I think the caveat would have to be an, a, a nice one, an honest, to find one that works. Yeah. I think, yeah, where, the, where they really are is good, honest feedback. So you actually, you, you, you do actually workshop your work and change it and to take advice in that. It's, it's not just for the sort of physical support of it. No, no. So we would exchange work in advance of every, every meeting. So we would email the work around in advance and then we would all prepare our written critiques of the pieces. And then we would share the, um, we would share the, 
the, our, our critiques and give our feedback at the group. So by way of discussion, and then we would email on our comments afterwards. So that after the writing group meeting, everyone has this set of comments on whatever story Brilliant. they sent in. So they have those beside them at their writing desk when they're doing the next draft. Brilliant. That sounds absolutely wonderful. Um, if you ever get stuck, what do you do? Do you read somebody else? And if so, is there a particular author you read? Do you listen to music, go for a walk? Do you have a way of getting out of stuckness or does it never happen? Because I'm usually doing quite a few things at the same time in terms of like I'm working on a number of different pieces at any given time. So right. I usually have two or three stories at least, you know, partially. Oh, do you? Yeah, plus a, plus a novel. And maybe if I'm writing an essay on something, there's probably an essay to be written or finished somewhere around my desk as well. So what, what happens with me if I kind of get stuck on something, I will move and work on something else for a while until I feel, yeah, OK, I can go back to that other thing again. And are you extremely disciplined? I'm not. No. Not, not extremely disciplined. I put in a lot of hours, but yeah. they wouldn't be very disciplined hours in that I don't have any set times for working okay. on particular things. And but I have you, you work every day, do you? Um, I try I try to, yeah. yeah. But I'm not terribly organized on um, you know, deciding that I'm going to work on this thing this week and get that finished. And then next sure. week I'll work on something else. I kind of go with go with the flow. So I'm not not disciplined that way. And sometimes I think I maybe need maybe need more discipline that way, that maybe I need to give myself more deadlines um, that I might finish things faster because I'm a very slow writer. I mean, how have you found all these lockdowns? Um, a lot of writers, it seems to have taken people two ways. Some are just writing on the way they normally do. Others are finding it so difficult because none of us knows what post, post COVID is going to be like. Where are you on that? Have you been able to concentrate and keep going? Well, I think in the beginning it was fine. And in the beginning, for so for the first lockdown, I was actually in quite a positive frame of mind and I was going out for walks and doing writing and I thought yeah I can I can handle this fine um but I have to say the longer it has gone on the um the more the the creativity is kind of sinking and the anxiety is rising so yeah this current lockdown is just really really dragging on I think for the first lockdown I was fortunate as well and that I had just got back I'd gone to Kilre League again, ah. just maybe February, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it was very shortly before the first lockdown. So I'd been at Kilre League and I'd got a great chunk of work done. So I was able to, you know, bring that home from Kilre League and I had that to be working on. So that also helped with keeping creativity going and keeping the work moving in the earlier stages of lockdown. But mm. Yeah, I've I've really noticed um, the the anxiety settling in lately, and I say that as someone who has been so fortunate that myself and my family have escaped the worst of COVID. So uh, you know, I've been really really lucky um, in terms of how COVID has affected me, and and there's still this anxiety that has crept in from it. Sure. Well, I think it's been a difficult month, hasn't it? Yes. It really has. Um, you, when your short stories came out, they were amazing. And as Anne, as Anne Enright said, they weren't like a debut. You were hailed as this incredible short story writer. You're now being hailed as an incredible novelist. Will you go back to short stories again? Or will you stick to novels now? What do you think the future holds? So I, so I stayed with short stories all the way through doing the novel and, and okay. I've actually written a second novel since The Art of Falling. So I, I think it's going to be um, writing them side by side into the future, okay. how, how I see it now, because I loved the short stories and I kept writing them while I was writing the novel. Um, but 
I also really like writing novels now and I wrote another one um, since. So yeah, so I plan to keep keep writing. That's those. very good news. When is When can we expect to see the second novel? Um, I haven't shown it to anyone yet, except my writing group have started only in the last couple of meetings to see um, some of the early chapters of it that are in a slightly more polished state than the later stages of it, which are still very, very messy. So um, it's going to be a while in the making yet. Do you ever think what would have happened and how your life would be now had you not got sick? Um, I, yeah, yeah, it does. It does cross my mind um, sometimes. I suppose there's always this, you know, this question of, you know, are, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing with, with our lives? And um, You can't have any doubts, surely. Well, I'm very happy writing. I can say that I'm very, very happy writing because I also liked law and because the language of law and the things that law could do interested me so much. Um, and there are things that law can do that writing can't, you know. So occasionally, um, I do I do miss it sometimes, but but we'll see, you know. Um, possibly there may come a time when I could go back and do a little bit of law again without giving up the writing. So I just. See it's so nice to talk to a writer who says, yes, I love writing, I'm happy, rather than saying, oh, it's such hard work, it really is a job, and it's, you know, it's not easy. Um, it's, it's absolute light. I just have one more question before I open it up to the audience. Do you keep a diary? Um, no. <laughs> they're, they're dangerous things. I Yes, anyone who's read the book will know why I asked that question. They are indeed dangerous things. Let's have a look now. Q and A. Hang on. There we are. Anne O'Brien says you mentioned starting to write this novel at a writing retreat in 2014. Have you been writing it since then? So I have been writing it since then, um, but not only writing it and I would have times when I would have maybe like taken a break between drafts and worked on something else and then gone back to it so there would have been chunks of time when I might have sent it to a publisher for example and then they're going through it and they're putting their comments and their feedback on it so I would have that time away from the novel and then it would come back to me again and I would have another draft to do and to work on those edits and I, so I would write it for a while and then I would send off those edits and then it would be gone from my desk for a bit so um, it would be away from me and um, sort of out of my head while it's away and I'd be working on other things. So, Interesting. I, yeah, Sorry. Maybe, maybe only about a year ago or so. I've lost track of time now with last year and time getting blurry, but definitely I would have been writing it, I would think, up to 2019 anyway. An interesting one here from Anne O'Brien. I think um, Virginia Woolf speaks of the necessity of killing the angel in the house. How does Danielle avoid being directed? sorry, distracted by parent household duties and prioritise her writing. In other words, do you do you burn the baked beans? Yeah. OK, so at the moment, um, I have, I suppose, I'm very fortunate in that my kids are all teenagers now. My youngest is 14. So um, the reality is now that, you know, they don't need me um, keeping an eye on them and I have lots of time that I can devote to my writing. I've never been great at housekeeping and um, fortunately nobody in our household is too fussy about what state the house is in, you know, we just try and keep it, you know, not in total chaos. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm, I'm fortunate that I do have a lot, a lot of writing time now that they're older. Um, yeah, I, maybe I took a lot of writing time when they were younger as well, I have to say, you know, um, I probably wouldn't be getting any Mother of the Year awards. Um, I would have 
you know, spent lots of time writing um, when I had some time off. Um, but I, I'm very lucky at the moment. I have time, which is which is the big thing. Deirdre Crowley asks, how did you structure the story? Did you plot it around the themes and the characters? And did you know the ending when you started the story or did it just evolve as you wrote it? Okay, so um, I didn't plot it around themes. It was more the themes kind of grew and wove in and out around the characters' lives as, they, as the stories of those were, were coming out and becoming clearer. Um, I didn't know the ending when I started writing it, but I think I probably thought I knew the ending and it was a different one, which is the case with most stories I write. Um, it's the case with short stories as well. So I would have started out with um, an idea for what the ending would be. Um, that's not what the ending at all is in the book as it currently stands. But I like to have a plan it's like, a, I just like to have a plan and feel that I know what direction this is headed in when I'm starting out writing. Um, but it tends, it tends to change an awful lot. And that was one of the things that was the same I found between, you know, with writing short stories and writing the novel, there were lots of differences. But for me, that was one thing that was the same. I would, plot, you know, I would think I had a scaffold and a plot and it, it would have changed so much by the time I got to the final. Do you, do you use whiteboards or walls or any devices like that to plan? I know some writers have, like I think um, Catherine McMahon cuts her whole novel up and she does a jigsaw with it. Do you have any sort of practical things that you do like that? Well, for, for the new novel, uh, my second novel, um, I have some practical things for that. I think maybe I learned from taking so long to write the first one that, that I could use some, some help and that there are things that might be useful. So for the second novel, I have a, what I think of as a mood board, but if I'm going through a magazine and I see an armchair and I think, oh, that is exactly the kind of armchair that this character would have in her house, I might snip it out and pin it to the mood board. Or if there's a dog that, I see in a magazine and it's just like the dog that I envisage um, my character having in the novel. I'll chop the dog out and I'll pin the dog to, to my mood board. Um, I'll pin bits of sky and fields and things like that that will give me a feel for um, the picture, I suppose, that I'm putting together for the novel. So I'm doing that for the second novel. And um, I definitely like that. It's fun anyway, whether it's going to end up being a practical help or not only time will tell, but it's it's fun to do that. And for the second novel, I've also started using Scrivener. I don't know if you use Scrivener. I've heard of Scrivener, I've never used it. Yeah, um, I, I've is, heard of is it. Is it good? I'm finding it very useful, yeah. Mm. Maybe I will try it. Um, lovely Catherine Cohen. Hi, Catherine. Um, is it too soon for Danielle to tell us a mini hint of what novel two is like? Um, I have, I haven't even started talking about novel two because I'm like, I'm like superstitious that it'll all just vanish. Um, but I can say that it's very different to the first one. Um, it's also set in Ireland, but but inland. Ah, and it's more, uh, more rural novel than um, the Art of Falling is between um, Cork City and West Cork, and the next novel is a. Uh, very much a rural location. This is actually quite an interesting um, one from Rosalind Lewis, because I know that the title did change. She says, congratulations, Danielle. How did you find finally decide on the title, The Art of Falling, or was it always apparent? Would love to hear how authors get the get their titles, because there were three titles, weren't there, for this one? Yeah, that's right. And for years, it was the chalk sculpture. So that was what I used to save it on my computer as, and that's what I thought of it as. And that was going to be my title for a while. But then around the time that we were thinking of titles, um, just coincidentally, there were lots of other books out that had chalk in the title. Oh. Whatever was in the ether. Oh, the Chalk Boy was one, and, there, I think. And the Chalk Man. The chalk Man, maybe, yeah. The Chalk Artist. Um, so the Chalk Sculpture would have been just <laughs> 
just two tools to things. And they were, I think they were all works of fiction as well. So another work of fiction, right. similar name around yeah. the same time. Um, so then it was retrospective, which I, I picked out because it, um, I suppose it resonated with the with the art themes in the novel, yeah. and also with the idea of looking back in retrospective and how we present mm -hmm. things or how we read or understand life retrospectively, um, which uh, you know chimed for me with the, the relationships in in the book and the way that people's pasts come yeah. back and impact on their present and. And so it was, that was kind of a working title for a while. And then someone at my publishers came up with um, the art of falling. And um, that encapsulates, it encapsulates the, the art side of the novel. And there's also a lot of falls yes. of different types. There's financial falls because, um, you know, there's the, the after effects of the financial crash. And yeah. There's um, relationship falls and falls and friendships, so so that that worked as well. And also that title works. Um, and I'm not sure if the person who thought that was had this in mind when they were choosing it, but it also really works for me because I have a short story um, called The Art of Foot Binding, and ah. mother and daughter in that short story. Um, and the house they live in, I saw an overlap between them and Nessa and her daughter and their house in this novel. So there's kind of this just a few pages at the start of the novel where it kind of has this overlap with that short story. So the publishers came up with it, but you immediately jumped at it and saw I, the, yeah, saw I thought, the I thought it worked, yeah. appropriateness. It really does. Um, how do you know when a story is ready? Asked Emily Devane. De De uh, sorry, I may have pronounced her wrong. Devane, I think. How do you know when a story is ready? I'm very bad at knowing when a story is ready. So I very much rely on other people to tell me whether it's my writing group or my agent or an editor. So I very, very much need someone else to say, yeah, this is working and I think this is ready now. Um, it's working as a story. I it's very hard to, well, I think it's quite difficult to have a good sense of whether something is, is finished or not yourself, because as a writer, we have all these things in our head and maybe we're yeah. thinking that they're coming out onto the page for the reader, but, but they may not be. So we have bits of the characters going around in our head. So um, we may be um, filling in bits of the story that we haven't actually got to the page. For the reader yet so i rely so sorry that's a long-winded answer but the, the short answer is i rely on other people to tell me uh, and that would be that would apply to the short story as well as the novel yeah really yeah that's interesting what writers do you love says mary graham oh um well you know um it's i know it the pandemic has been awful in so many ways but i've actually got more um more reading done the past yeah. year actually than i have for for many years um so first in terms of influences over the years um anna and Wright would be a big one and alice Monroe, yeah. um, kevin barry william trevor george saunders um i've read some really great new fiction recently Oh, I've just finished Laura McKenna's debut novel. Well, I'm about to read that. Words to shape my name, and that is wonderful, wonderful, such an absorbing book. Um, and I also read recently *A Quiet Tide* by Marion Lee. Oh, that's wonderful too. By the female botanist Ellen Hutchins, and that was yeah, beautiful mm. book as well. I think I must say uh, the debuts because I see all the debuts pretty much that come out and so far this year I mean and the ones that I know are coming I say it every year but I think this is going to be the best year for debuts oh, yeah. judging from the things I mean it's extraordinary I, I, where do you think that where does it come from this talent that Irish women have suddenly well not suddenly but this flowering talent um I think maybe there's um it might be going back to 
the greater sense of possibility now and the mm -hmm. increase in, in publishers who are paying attention to the work, I think, because I, I think that maybe you know, if we went back 50 or 60 years, there was great um, writing talent then as well, but there just wasn't anywhere for people to go with it, or maybe right. somewhere it was just being dismissed or rejected for various reasons and there weren't the publishers there and um, there weren't the publishers there who were interested in work and maybe especially um for writing by women and i think that has changed now so the i think the, the literary journals and um the increase in the publishers has has made a big difference and i think um there's you know creative writing is is taught now and I don't recall that being there before when I was younger, you know, so I think that's no. more. You, you, de you didn't take a course, did you ever? Um, I didn't, I didn't take a creative writing masters, but I did an awful lot of workshops. So I would do a lot of workshops that were on at festivals and things like that, because I really do believe that writing can be taught and there's, you know, there's just elements of craft and they can be learned the same way as other aspects of any other job can can be learned. So I think the availability of creative writing workshops and creative writing courses in universities has also um, had a big impact. I, yeah. I think. Somebody says here, Alex Catherwood says, I think Danielle said she did not research any particular art for this. If so, bravo. But was it 100% imagination? Um, so it's 100% imagination in that the sculptor is, he's entirely fictional and all the pieces I made up for him are entirely fictional. Um, I have always liked, um, you know, wandering into museums and art galleries. So I would be doing that anyway and looking at things. And if I came across an article about um, an artist in a magazine, I would be likely to stop and read it. So mm -hmm. it was kind of more, uh, I don't want to say a, a low level interest in art, but I didn't do what I might call academic research, but I would be keeping an eye out, going around galleries and magazines and thinking, yeah, maybe maybe my fictional sculptor, sculptor might have done something like that. Mm -hmm. And I did, um, I did have to look up certain um, details like what other sculptors would have been working um, at the same time as my fictional sculptor, things like that, because whenever I had to refer to um, one of his one of his colleagues, I, I would have to look up and find out who else would have been working um, in yeah. sculpture at that time. I think we'd better stop, but apologies to the people whose um, questions I didn't get to. But just one last thing from me, which is, do you envy the young writers for starting off in their 20s, the Sally Rooney's of this world? Do you think your writing would have been different or better, or do you think its strength comes from starting later? How, how do you feel about that? Well, maybe this is a personality thing and also, I think because there's no right or wrong time to start to become a writer that for some people it will be when they're young and for some people it will be middle-aged and for some people it will be when they're older um i'm glad that i came to writing older i'm not sure yeah. i would have survived um coming to to writing younger um i think in many ways the art sector can be a tougher one to to survive in than um than law maybe um, sure. in, in some ways so um i'm i'm kind of glad it happened now and i wouldn't exchange any of my previous career um at all i've i've no wish that i had found writing when i was 18 or 19 for example i'm i'm very glad that that i had that other life first would you advise your children if they wanted to write to do something else first? Um, I'm very careful about not pushing them towards writing because I'm conscious that it might be me just pushing something that I like yeah. on them. 
and actually they do write really good things and sometimes I will see a competition for teenagers and I will point it out to, to them <laughs> but I have to remind myself that I can't be pushing them to to, to enter or to write something for them if they don't want to um yeah I would I suppose if they really wanted to write um, when they were young, I would just say to them, yeah, go, go ahead and do it if you can and find some way to do it. Um, or the other way of looking at that is I would say to someone, um, you know, sometimes I think that if someone asks me if they should be a writer, that I tell them no because if they thought they had any element of choice in it, if they were, you know, still asking, sure. if they thought there was something else they could do and be happy with, maybe they'd be as well off going and doing that other thing. But Absolutely. If they think there's nothing else that they could do and be happy other than write, well, then they're going to go be a writer. Anyway. And that's a that's a very good place to end. Thank you so much. And for anybody who hasn't read it yet, you are in for an absolute treat. Carve out time for yourself pour yourself a glass of wine, curl up and enjoy. It's just the most magical book. Thank you so much. I wish we could have a load of applause now. And thank you to you <laughs> and Danielle. That was absolutely marvellous. And I suppose we'd just like to officially declare The Art of Falling launched. Um, that was a marvellous event. I encourage you all to go out and buy the book, read it. You're going to love it. So Sue and Danielle, thank you to you both. <laughs>